Good afternoon, Maud. Uh, you're coming out here on March 21st uh, in anticipation of World Water Day uh, to be hosted by the La Pêche Coalition for the Green Yield Day. Can you tell us what uh, World Water Day means to you? Well, World Water Day is a day to both celebrate water and what we're doing to protect water, but also to remind the world that we're not doing well enough yet. So it's it's the, the good and the bad. Um, we have a planet running out of clean water. I mean, the simple reality is it's, it's a very, very serious situation. Um, you know, I won't go into a million statistics, but the UN puts out graphs that show that the demand for water in our world is going straight up and the supply is going straight down. And that at least 2 billion people every single day are forced to drink contaminated water because they can't uh, access uh, clean water. And during this time of COVID, um, we know that the first thing we were told a year, about a year ago now, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands with soap and warm water. Uh, over half the population of the world doesn't have that facility. They don't have a place to do that. So World Water Day means um, really stopping and thinking about this precious thing we call water that gives us life uh, that we haven't taken very good care of, particularly in the more sophisticated consumer oriented countries where we're consuming it too fast, we're polluting it, we're diverting it from where nature put it to where we want it. We see it as an industrial resource for us or for, con for convenience and profit. And we've lost sight, we've lost touch with the meaning of water. So World Water Day is a day to stop and really think about this a phenomenal gift of water and, and how we can do much, much better in everywhere in our world, certainly here in Canada as well. So you mentioned that um, people in some places are not able to wash their hands and sanitize uh, with water during COVID. Has COVID had other kind of impacts on water access during the pandemic? You know, if there's anything good that's gonna come from this COVID a crisis and this terrible year we've all been through, it is going to be that it put the spotlight on the fact that you cannot do the very basic things necessary to protect yourself from COVID or any other variant or any other anything that comes along in terms of public health if you don't have access to sanitation. We've been talking about the need for sanitation for a long time. Uh, the United Nations has recognized the human right to sanitation and, and water. Um, 10 and a half years, almost 11 years ago now. Uh, and certainly there are, have been programs to try to rectify that, but it's when COVID came along, it became so clear. I mean, in some countries, two thirds of the, the um, health facilities, the clinics, the health clinics don't have running water. I mean, how are you dealing with COVID victims with, you with no running water? So I, I don't, this is only anecdotal. I'm, I'm working with the uh, special rapporteur on the human rights to water and sanitation. And I think we're gathering some more uh, evidence in, in a, in a, in a in a um, more systemic way, but I have been collecting a lot of information and I'm pretty sure I can say categorically that aid agencies and wealthy countries putting money into COVID uh, related issues or funding in, in the global south, a lot of it's going to, uh, to sanitation. And that's a really positive thing because it, that would be permanent. Once the pandemic's over, you've got the, the sanitation services there. We're talking schools, we're talking clinics, we're talking even bus stops and train stops and, and public areas where there's um, sanitation is being uh, highlighted. So, you know, and I think the other thing that's going to come from COVID is our knowledge that the private sector blew it. I mean, you, you, the whole experiment with economic globalization, let the market do everything, let the market make the decisions, governments hands off, that just hasn't worked. And there are a massive uh, requirement for government funding. I mean, look what Biden's just done, that, that you know, multi-billion dollar uh, stimulus and it, a lot of it's going to permanent healthcare facilities, um, public services, uh, public services for children, the, the knowledge that the private sector failed, it, it wasn't able to keep up with the, 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 the supply demands of the personal 
protection uh, the, uh, services that we need and so on. So I think there's been a sea change in the way we understand what government, the role of government is and how important it is that governments do not abandon uh, all of us to the, to the private sector. Even, I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing some writing right now on this and a new book I'm writing on hope and activism. And even the International Monetary Fund, for heaven's sake, is saying that's enough, depending on the private sector, there has to be permanent, uh, important public spending on public services uh, everywhere. And they're calling on the G7 countries and the wealthier countries to lead the way. There's just been a sea change in the way we, we all look at this. And I, I think that that will be something permanent that will come out of this COVID crisis. Do you know why it took COVID to draw uh, attention to this issue? I mean, you, you've said before that uh, roughly 3 million people die from uh, uh, unclean water every year. That's more than we've had in terms of deaths from COVID crisis so far. Why is there such an imbalance in terms of the international attention that's being paid to these two issues? Um, there would be a couple of answers to that. One is that we've tended collectively to lump the water problem in with climate change. So if you just fight climate change, everything else will be okay. And I keep saying, no, you could stop every greenhouse gas emission in the world tomorrow and we'd still have a, a water crisis. Um, the water crisis is a human crisis, but it's also an ecological crisis. And we need to think about that. And I think what the COVID, cri the COVID pandemic did was that it put the spotlight on that. So you could see that really clearly. But I think the other thing is that there's an understanding that nobody's safe from these pandemics until everybody's safe. Now we're hearing this about the vaccines. Vaccines in wealthier countries, okay, you're going to, you know, lower the, 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 the rate of the, the virus, but, you know, you're going to have variants and mutant mutations coming from countries that have not been able to vaccinate their population. And there's an understanding, I, I think more of an understanding that we really are one world, we really are one entity, um, and that no one's safe until everyone's safe. And you're hearing this kind of language. It's not just humanitarian, although the humanitarian part of it, of course is in incredibly important but it's an understanding that th this balance is is for everyone it's no one's going to be safe until we understand that this is an equal opportunity virus and yes it hurts pe people of color and indigenous people first because certain people are out there you know driving the trucks and and and, and delivering goods and working in meatpacking plants and other people are lucky enough to be home and, and so there's a division there but the, the virus hits you, it hits you. And I, I think that there's been a, maybe a new age of compassion. I, I would like to think that it's made us go stand back and think about what matters, um, maybe more than we did before. So do you feel like currently things are heading in a good direction globally, or would you say we're heading in the wrong direction right now? No, I think we're heading in a better direction now when the, the, the United Nations recognized the human right to water and sanitation. Since then, um, a few of these were before that, but about four dozen countries have either amended their constitution to include the human right to water, um, or they brought in separate laws. A number of countries with international aid, that's true, but have very clearly targeted um, and the obligation they have to provide clean water and sanitation to their people. Other countries have realized that turning the water off, shutoffs are wrong. I mean, something like 15 million people a year were getting their water cut off in the United States alone because they couldn't pay for their water bills. Very often they're older people, perhaps immigrants or uh, um, uh, African-American or students or whatever, and they just simply couldn't afford it. Unemployed people and they just come in and, and, and yank the water. Um, there's been an understanding that this is profoundly wrong. And, uh, and there, was a, there were laws in many states and municipalities in the United States against this during the coronavirus. And I think you're going to see that gets extended. So, I, you know, I, 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 you know I, I'm just writing this book on hope. So that's why this is fresh in my mind. But I was writing about my time in the women's movement. That's my first activism was that. And just the tremendous changes for women in my lifetime and certainly in my mother's lifetime. Uh, and, and I talk about the, what happens to a, a movement or a, 
an understanding or a campaign that it, you're climbing, 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 and then it suddenly becomes something that most people agree on. The women's movement met um, tremendous backlash from men who didn't want it to change. Um, and then all of a sudden that stopped. And I'm not saying there aren't problems for women, please don't get me wrong, but there, it became something that the general population agreed on, the women's humanity, women's equal rights. And so the second phase of feminism really has profoundly changed uh, life for young women. Um, we're now into a new phase and it's got new challenges, but you re we really can change is what I'm saying. As a society, we can have new values. And I think that we are entering what I call the age of nature. This is a, an understanding. And of course, it's a very old understanding and it's very much part of indigenous teachings and, and culture and values that we are part of nature. We're not above nature, we're not separate from nature, we are nature. And if we don't take care of nature um, and the water and the soil and the forests and the wetlands and so on, we are, we're, we are, you know, we're in trouble too. I do think there's a change. And one of the things that I've, I've remarked on and written about in this book on, it's on hope and change, uh, hope and activism, is that there has been a recognition of the need for looking at climate change, the need for uh, nature-based solutions. So yes, keep fighting the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, that the fossil fuels, of course we do that. But healthy soils are a carbon sink. Forests are a carbon sink, you know. Uh, healthy watersheds uh, bring back the rain and, 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 and are responsible for a healthy hydrologic cycle. And if you move either the vegetation or the water from a, a local ecological system, a hydrologic cycle, it heats up. One of the ways that we cool the, the temperature is, is uh, the recovery of watersheds. And I, I, I've just been noting that at the UN, at international, uh, uh, people talking internationally around climate are suddenly sh shifting their lens over to protecting the earth, putting more land and water aside to be protected, um, rewilding, um, uh, replanting. Uh, replanting wetlands. We were, were uh, what does soil mean? The whole regenerative uh, agri agriculture movement is very exciting. There's just a lot of exciting things happening. And if you're on the tail end or the receiving end, as I am, of many, many, many reports of terrible doom and, you know, insect Armageddon and, you know, sixth generation extinction and all that, you can get very, very depressed. And I worry about young people because I think it would be an awful message if you're 16 years old to be told you've only, the planet's only got six, 10 years left, right? I mean, I just don't think that's a helpful thing to say to kids. Um, and what people need to know is that there's a lot happening. There's a counter movement out there. And when even the major institutions that have promoting, been promoting economic and uh, economic globalization and deregulation and, and you know governments get out of the way, let the market do everything. When even those institutions are saying something went wrong, I don't know how we were so wrong, but we were wrong. You know that we're 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 in for another societal change. And and in spite of the issues that we're all dealing with, I actually am hopeful. So you've been involved in, with this issue for many, many years. Yes. Can you tell me what, what attracted you in particular about water access among all the issues you could have chosen to focus on? Well, when um, I found help found the Council of Canadians, it was in 1985. It was in, in relation to a response to the, the proposed Canada-US free trade agreement. Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States and Brian Mulroney was the newly minted Prime Minister here, and they were two right wingers who were coming together to build a free trade zone. And we were very nervous, a number of us, about would we be able to Canada have, would Canada be able to have its own foreign policy? Could we maintain our cultural policies? Could we maintain uh, uh, protection of our resources? And at that time, there were major projects proposed to move Canadian water. One was Noapa, that was the Western one, and there was, the, there was an Eastern Grand Canal as well. Major plans were backed by the then premier of Quebec, Bourassa, and Maloney backed it uh, for major water uh, uh, shipments, may, you know, pipeline systems, major water exports, commercial exports to the United States. And we'd been fighting this very hard. Um, and then I sat down and I was reading that Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and I looked at the annex at the, at the end that said, 
um, you know, listed all the goods, everything that's going to be subject to the rules, basically governments with their hands off and there was water in all its, uh, in all its forms, including ice and snow. And I thought, how could water, what, what is water doing as a tradable good in a trade agreement? I don't understand. And that's what set me on the journey. It wasn't an environmental issue. It was Canada's water. It can't be put on the open market. It cannot be commercially traded. It cannot be exported for money. It is not going to be controlled by corporations. And that that's how it started. And then I started realizing, wait a minute, this is a much bigger issue than just in Canada. I started um, traveling a great deal and realizing that people were dying from lack of water in the global south, that it was very much a women's issue. And I'd come out of the women's movement. Um, I started realizing it was more than just a human rights issue, but it was also a rights of nature issue uh, because, you know, we don't protect the ecosystem. You can't expect people to take care of something if they have no money. I mean, you have to, you have, you have to put the human right and the rights of the planet together. Um, and so it just grew bit by bit. And then I started, I wrote a report um, on, on called Blue Gold and that morphed into a book. And then I guess the book I'm writing I guess the, the one that I am launching in uh, in uh, on uh, in Wakefield is the um, fifth book on water and many reports. So I just kind of I jumped into the deep end of the pool, if, if you will. But it started with a concern about Canada's water and um, and protecting it from commercial exploitation and commodification. And you know, right to this day, we're still fighting that kind of thing. Uh, just about a month and a half ago. A major derivatives company in the United States announced that it's going to put uh, water on it, water futures on, on its portfolio. So you're not just bidding on actual water, you're bidding on water scarcity. You're basically bidding uh, against water drought and water scarcity in the future. It's it, the financialization of water is upon us. So there are many, many forms of threats to water that I followed over the years and um, water trading, privatization of water services, bottled water. I mean, we put people, uh, people buy a million bottles of plastic, plastic bottles of water every minute in the world. And you know, that's all going into oceans and lakes and forests and so on. And it's all still here somewhere on the planet. So there are many, many forms of the commodification of water. And it's just been one of the, um, driving forces in my life. But yeah, it started with reading that trade agreement. So can you help me understand why commodification is still going on if in 2010 you were part of a group that got this UN resolution passed to have water declared a human right? So if it's a human right, how is it at the same time a commodity that can be bought and sold? Well, you see, that's the issue. We argue that uh, because it's a human right, it has to be a public trust. It must be controlled democratically. It must not be allowed to fall into to, uh, human uh, or, or corporate hands or private hands, because once it's there, not only can you not control who has access to it, it's going to be the wealthy who make the decision, but you also are not able to be sure that water itself is being protected because it's all privately owned and who knows what they're doing with it. I mean, you get mining companies Canadian mining companies going to countries in the global south, getting 50 years of access, a contract of access to the water there so they can dump their toxics in. That's privatization of the water, in my opinion. Um, you can have a, a human rights uh, recognition at the United Nations. There's no army at the United Nations that's going to come in and make you do what's right to do. I mean, we outlawed torture in the 1948 Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights, and there's still torture in the world, um, tragically. But as a human family, we said torture is wrong. As, as a human family, we said that no one should have to watch their child die because of waterborne disease. We made that decision in 2010. And so it takes time for that to become real. Um, and some countries just, I mean, Bolsonaro uh, in, in, in uh, Brazil is saying, who cares? He wouldn't even know that the United Nations adopted that. He was just raising the, the Amazon. He doesn't care what happens to the human rights of the indigenous peoples there, to the water, to the water system of the whole of Brazil depends on the water system that is uh, regulated by the by the Amazon forest. I mean, he just doesn't care. So how do you make people care about this? Um, it's, it's long and hard. In Canada, as you know, 
we have a crisis of water and still in a number of First Nations communities. And we've been arguing that the human right to water and sanitation is now international law and the Canadian government has the obligation, not just it would be nice, the obligation to ensure clean water and sanitation. And I think in fairness to this government, I think that they've taken that more seriously certainly than any other previous government um, and have um, improved the situation in a number of First Nations communities and still have some, some to go. Um, but it's, it got started to get seriously attended to when, when the United Nations basically said, this is a human right. So, you know, it's like any fight, you, you take two steps forward and then maybe you have to take a step back because people are pushing back against you. There are some very powerful, forces out there um, that benefit from corporatization of water, from bottled water companies to the big, huge companies, Suez and, and, and uh, Veolia that uh, supply uh, uh, private water services. They're, they're huge transnational corporations and they make a huge amount of money from the privatization of water. Um, and they're not gonna give up easily. They're not gonna say, oh, well, it's a human right, so we'll just you know go away. No way, it's, so it's a, a constant struggle, as everything is, to assert um, a, a certain vision. Um, but it was really important that the United Nations recognized um, the human right to water. Canada voted not to agree. It abstained. This was under Stephen Harper. I was quite embarrassed at the time. But, anyway. <laughs> but Canada is now on side, so we're okay now. So your most recent book, I know you've been talking about an upcoming book, but your most recent book, Whose Water Is It Anyway, talks about this concept of blue communities. Have you yes. now arrived at the conclusion that it's it's really at the community level that people can yeah. have the most effective impact, more than the federal government, more than the international bodies? Is, is that where the focus needs to be in terms of water protection right now? I, I would say they all matter. I think it was extraordinarily important for the UN to recognize the human right to water. I think it's very important that our national governments uh, recognize not only the human right to water, but their responsibility to take care of water. We do not have adequate legislation in this country to protect water. We don't protect our groundwater properly. We don't protect our water systems from the runoff from factory farms. That's why Lake Winnipeg is so sick. Um, you know, we let, allow chemicals in our, in our water that should not be there. Uh, we allow mining and, and, and energy uh, extraction that, uh, you know, just absolutely destroys local water systems. So believe me, we need laws at all levels of government. But the community level is incredibly important. And, and the empowering thing about the Blue Communities concept is that you can do this locally. Blue communities started in Canada with when the Council of Canadians and the Canadian Union of Public Employees held a, a big conference in Ottawa in 2009. And Stephen Harper was in power then and he was promoting public-private partnerships, par privatization of water services. If a municipality was upgrading its infrastructure or building new infrastructure because the city was growing, um, the only way they could get federal funding was if um, they did the, a move to a, a privatized system. So we were saying, rather than be against that, let's be for something. So we launched the Blue Communities concept. It was for just mun municipalities and just for Canada at first, but it's exploded. And it was basically having the municipality promise three things, that water is a human right and they will protect and, and, and promote that, that water is a public trust, so not allow it to be privatized, and that they will phase out the, the use of bottled water on municipal premises and at conferences and conventions and concerts and stuff that, that, that the municipality put, puts on. And a number of them have been have gone way farther than that. They've done whole public um, uh, education uh, programs for students, for their, their public uh, on this issue. We have dozens of municipalities in Canada, some very small, some big, Montreal, Vancouver, um, both, just both recently became a blue community. Um, but it's spread. It's spread to Europe. We have big cities like Paris and Berlin and Brussels. Los Angeles has become a blue community. But it also started then to uh, be picked up by universities, post-secondary education institutions, by faith-based groups, the World Council of Churches, 
with 500 million Christians around the world and churches around the world um, has become a blue community and they're promoting the notion of water as a public trust and, and human right. So it's really growing in a beautiful way. I'm working with an elementary school here in Ottawa where two of my grandkids went um, for them to become the first elementary school in uh, anywhere, I guess. Uh, we were hoping to do it last year, then COVID hit, but we're still working on it. So it, it's really the notion that you can be, you can be. I would like libraries to become a blue community or seniors residences. I don't see why we can't have that thinking that we become conscious of blue, conscious of water, conscious of the human right to water, conscious of this beautiful gift of water that we're not caring for and that we can do something at a, at a local level. And I even had a woman come up to me after a talk. She said, I've become a blue community. And I said, by yourself? She said, yeah. She said, I drink bottled water all the time. I just drank my last bottle of plastic water ever. She said, I knew nothing about this. I knew nothing about the stats you talked about. I didn't realize it was a world crisis. So she said, I'm going to learn. I'm going to get your book. I'm going to study. And then she said, um, and I'm going to find a group in my community that I can work with to, to do something. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a blue community, she said. And I thought, well, why not? You know, why? <laughs> Why can't we think of this at a, at a I mean, community starts right here. Um, and a lot of the kids, for instance, in the schools that I work with come home and they talk to their parents about it. Where do we waste water? And do we take, and what do we put down the drain that hurts other people's water? Maybe it's out of our sight, but it's, it's, it's in the water system. So uh, it, it's a, it's a consciousness raising really it is. And it, it takes time, but it's, um, it's a lovely concept in community. It just means you're for something instead of against something. And we activists are so often fighting against something and it's nice to be for something. Right, so uh, Wakefield is not currently a, a blue community is the objective uh, for you to help facilitate that somehow? I would love for, for Wakefield to become a blue community. And yes, it is one of my secret reasons for the, the event. Um, it's, uh, you know, my, the book is coming out, by the way, in, on World Water Day, March 22nd, in French, in Quebec. So it's being published um, in, in French, too, which I'm really pleased about. Uh, it, the, the Blue Communities uh, Project has done really, really well in Quebec. A group called Osicour is doing fabulous work and has been behind um, dozens of municipalities becoming Blue Communities in Quebec. So. Um, they'll be no doubt working with um, the folks who are putting on this event um, on, on, you know, in the event with me in Wakefield, I'm sure we'll want to take it a step further. It would be wonderful. And, you know, if the other thing is that it gets people talking about it. What does it mean? Well, then what are we doing about plastics? I remember speaking a little community called Bayfield up in on Lake Huron near Goderidge. And they were so excited about the concept. They decided to take it a, a, a step further and go plastics free as a community. Now they are a small community, but they become kind of big in the summer because they're a gorgeous area right on, on uh, Georgian Bay and, and they're, um, uh, they get lots of tourists and so on. And they went bottled water free. They went to all the cafes. They went to the restaurants. They went to the um, grocery stores. They went to the, uh, uh, you know, vendors and as well the schools, everybody, and got the entire community to go bottled water free. And I mean bottled water free. We were, I was there a few years after they made this decision. They're really into protecting the Great Lakes from from plastics pollution. And now that's a movement that's moving around the Great Lakes, by the way. Uh, but somebody saw a crushed old um, plastic bottle, water bottle on the on the sidewalk and said, "What's that?" And it was like they seen us, you know, something evil. Uh, I mean, you know, we have to change our ways. We we have to deal with this plastics crisis, and and so the the issue around the human right to water will vary. I mean, if you have a a community, big or small, uh, where the water is coming out clean and safe and, and, and affordable from your, your tap, you've got the human right to water, but, but who doesn't? Mo one of my favorite stories is Berlin. Berlin, uh, they had tried water privatization. It was a terrible mistake. They, they polluted the water, the water rates went up, the citizens were furious, they had a huge campaign. They got the 
contract canceled and got their water back under public uh, control. Um, and then they decided they wanted that permanent. So Berlin became a blue community. And I was there just was about a year ago now. We had a big ceremony. It was very, very nice. But they asked themselves, they said, we have clean, safe water coming out of all the taps in Berlin. And it's inexpensive and accessible to everybody. So what does the human right to water and sanitation mean? And they thought about it and they thought, we have a lot of migrants in our parks, homeless people, migrants in our parks and under our freeways, and they don't have access to sanitation or, or easily water, although if they can get to a tap, they can get to water. And so they did a, had a, made a contract with a fabulous young people who are building these uh, wooden toilets, um, but private. They're waterless toilets. They use sawdust and hand sanitizer. And um, it gives people a private place to use a washroom, which sounds, you know, what, what, who doesn't have it? Lots of people don't have that around the world. Um, a million people in the Los Angeles area, a million people don't have access to clean water and sanitation. I mean, it isn't just in the poor countries, really it isn't. And so I was terribly touched by that because they said, okay, we've taken this pledge, what does it mean? And so it's going to mean different things in different places. Um, and so it, it opens it up to a discussion about what can you, what part can you play? Um, maybe the school can do a study of the, the chemicals that are being put into our, onto our food production and into our water and do a, a you know, have the kids write the minister saying this, you know, this shouldn't be in our water. I just think it opens the door to a lot of consciousness about um, we have this water in Canada. We are so much more lucky than most places, but we're not taking very good care of it. And we owe it to the world and to the future to take care of it on our watch. And it's a really important concept, I think. And so what would you say would be the most effective policy that the federal government could put in place right now uh to well in this. yeah in in both that book and i wrote a, the book i wrote before was called boiling point um government neglect corporate abuse in canada's water crisis and i have a whole section on the different laws that we need we need laws around uh well the chemicals are, are just a huge issue and if anybody wants to follow this up they can go to echo 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 um uh, justice is, do, is a, a legal group that, that does work on, on the environment. And they've, they're the, them and the um, Suzuki Foundation are doing really important work on um, uh, chemicals that shouldn't be in our drinking water, shouldn't be in our food production. Um, we need better services and we, this is beginning to happen, wastewater treatment services uh, and the municipalities across the country have been given a timeline to improve um, wastewater um, services because a lot of um, untreated or semi-treated uh, sewage is still going into our water systems. Uh, we need better groundwater uh, protection. We don't, simply don't have enough. We need much stricter rules around mining and, and energy extraction. We, you know, the, again, back under the Harper government that hasn't been ended under the current government, um, they brought in a law that said that a mining company can apply to the government to have a lake that's at the moment being protected by the Fisheries Act, named, renamed, it's no longer a lake, it's now a tailings impoundment area. And so the mining company can dump its toxins in and ruin that water system because it's no longer a lake because as, and therefore no longer uh, protected by the, the, um, the Fisheries Act. That's gotta go. I mean, there's just, we just really, we, we have what I call the myth of abundance in this country. Just, you know, we have so much, you can dump anything you want in it. You can move it from where you want it to where nature placed it to where you want it. And there's, there's no, uh, there's, you know, no fallout. Well, there has to be. Learn about water, learn to love water, learn to be careful of water, um, learn to, we all need to internalize this notion that it's a gift and uh, it's sacred and we need to care for it more than we do. So a lot of Canadians may wonder why they need to worry about water access because we have so much water here. And in this area in La Peche, we have rivers, we have lakes, we have uh, natural spring water and people may wonder how, how this would affect them and why they should be concerned. 
Could you well, there was that? something called the Aral Sea, and it was a lake that was so big in the former Soviet Union <clears throat> that it was called a sea. It was the fourth largest lake in the world, um, and it's almost gone now. Um, the countries destroyed it by over extracting the water to grow cotton. They wanted to export cotton all over the world. You can destroy water in an amazingly short space of time. I mean, what we think of a, as abundance now can turn into something else. I mean, um, David Schindler, our world-renowned scientist who just died last week, and I'm very, very sad. He taught, he said, British Columbians had better get used to, you know, the orange skies because drought, permanent drought is here in British Columbia. Alberta is the first have-not water province in Canada. They have allocated every single drop. They don't have any extra. And as the glaciers melt, the Bow River and other rivers that depend on that, those glaciers are going to dry up. So, I mean, we just, you cannot assume that what is here today is going to be here tomorrow. Yes, the Wakefield area has more than most, but you can't assume that it's going to stay that way. And you can't assume that as people move into the community, and people are moving into the community that there aren't going to be more demands and you're not going to start seeing water being used in the wrong way. We need to say as a community, who is going to have access to this water and under what circumstances? And that's very important. Who gets priority access? I worked with the um, uh, policy people in Vermont uh, that brought in a groundwater protection law a number of years ago, and they basically said their water, surface and groundwater, uh, has, has a priority of in any time of shortage or any kind of competition or crisis. Water for daily human need is number one. Water for the ecosystem is number two. But interestingly, water for local food production, as opposed to the big uh, exporting agriculture or business uh, uh, that's the, that was their third. You look at a state, a state like California, I mean, they provide all the almonds and the walnuts and so much, you know, rice and alfalfa and really, really water intensive crops, not just for themselves locally, but for people across the country and people across the world. They're destroying their water table. They don't have the water. And same with Alberta with its beef farming. So we... We really need to ask, you know, just make this assumption that that because that water is here today and it's clean and it's good, it's going to be here forever. Not so. And we have a responsibility to care for it. Could you tell me more about the focus of your new upcoming book, which is not yet available? It's called The Little Book of Hope, Lessons uh, from a Lifetime of Activism. And it's um, coming out this time next year. And it's really about hope and and that we not false hope uh you know everything pollyannish everything's fine it's about realizing yes we have some very serious crises but we can collectively make change and here's the great stuff that's happening in many many different areas and um it is it, it's a book that gives some guidance lessons that i've I've learned over a lifetime of, of doing this kind of activism, but also um, really good initiatives that are happening now that people can get involved in. Because I think a lot of people feel overwhelmed, especially when they hear climate change. How do I affect climate change? You know, um, it's a little easier fighting for to maintain you know clean water against a pipeline or something. But um, you know, it's harder. It's harder conceptually to know what to do about as an individual about climate change. So I just think it's really important to, to give people a sense of that lots is happening, that they can get involved. Um, Wakefield is a very activist community. I mean, really has a wonderful basis of activism. And um, I have great faith that the community is going to care for its water and um, fight to keep it clean and safe uh, for future generations.